Hey, can I get one more piece of that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. What are you doing over there? Oh, I'm just uh, taping knives to my hands because we're going to make our show a little deadlier today. Oh, no, we're, we're talking about making Dungeons and Dragons more lethal. Trying to kill the players. Oh, no, that's the characters. But remember, it's not the players we're trying to kill. It's the characters that we're trying to kill. You know, the, the, okay. the PCs, the characters. Okay, so, yeah, 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 right, right. No, yeah. I'm with you. Okay. Um, but we, we are still on for the purge, though, later, right? Yeah? Yeah, it's going to be after this show on making it more deadly. <laughs> it's great. Web DM. This episode is brought to you by the Ordinary Towns Kickstarter from Legendary Pants. You never know when you're going to need a location at the drop of a hat. And this book has 50 towns to choose from. Each one has a hand-drawn map, adventure hooks, and at least a dozen fully fleshed out NPCs to drop into your campaign or to inspire your world building. Why aren't there more books like this? Only a few more days left to back it. It's already written and copies go out as soon as the Kickstarter is over. So check out the link here and in the description. Let's get fatalistic with it. Let's mm. talk about death. Oh man. Making uh, making that D&D more deadly. And what does it mean for D&D to be deadly? Lethal, deadly, it's sort of this uh, word that often gets thrown around uh, in terms of combat and, and a certain type of game or certain type of GMing style. Mm -hmm. But the Dungeon Master's Guide sort of defines a, a deadly encounter or deadly combat as being one which could be lethal. Yeah. potentially resulting in the deaths of one or more characters. There is a risk of defeat, and the players will have to use you know, good tactics and, and quick thinking in order to overcome the challenges. Now, personally to me, that just sounds like I, what I want all of my <laughs> combats to be, at least when I'm a player, because otherwise, like, what's the point of playing it out if it's yeah. if there's not a risk of defeat or, or something like that? We just yeah. kind of narrate it then, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you keep that in the RP, you know, if it's just one guy that really can't challenge the party. Then... <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, he could, like, take a swing at one person, but... A lot of this is system-dependent, right? So we're yeah. talking about D&D 5th Edition. In that case, it, it's a common thing that you see sometimes where, where people are saying, like, I can't uh, challenge my party... Uh, with the baseline monsters, or mm -hmm. or I, I have to do something to up my game to uh, to offer the players a fight that tests their abilities and, and challenges yeah. their uh, their play styles. And I think for me, it's it's often a question that I see dungeon masters ask, and yeah. not a lot of players, right? Like, well, I mean, <laughs> it's one of the I, things to think about. I mean, yes, players would like a challenge. But I don't know I've, if I've heard a lot of players calling for you know it to be more deadly. I know there are those people that love playing their games oh, sure. on yeah, yeah. you know survival mode with, mm -hmm. with on hard. Uh, but that's that's one thing. But D and D is is a whole other. What do you think the ratio is of like actual DMs versus actual players that want this? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously there are, there are players out there who want a, a challenging and difficult fight. You know, fights that require them to think and to to not just go on autopilot or, or spam their biggest spell and and you know not worry rest about up it. and try it again. Tomorrow. Rest up and try it again. They want to have to consider the the situation. A lot of times, uh, deadly is synonymous with tactical. Yeah. and complex. Yeah, there are players out there who want a more deadly fight or more challenging fight uh, in their 5th edition games, but in terms of just the sort of the people who are ask, it, it's usually a dungeon master asking because they feel like it's not challenging enough or it's not deadly enough. I bring it up if only because it's like, this is one of those areas where you might just like ask your players, hey, how do you guys feel about the fights and, and combats? Mm -hmm. Like, did you think it was challenging? Did you not? You know, that was a hard encounter. Uh, by the rules of the game, do you think it was hard? You can get a feel for what your players think versus what you think, because very often, like, as a dungeon master, you sit here and it's like, all your pieces die, <laughs> right? Like, you're constantly losing. You're constantly getting your ass kicked, your monsters are all over, uh, you know, a, a giant graveyard of, uh, of lost potential. If things go right, that's <laughs> the way it should be, yeah. It skews the thinking sometimes, where you might think, like, oh man, like, because, I mean, you've, have you, has this happened to you? All the time. Yeah. All the time it happens to me. It's happened to me, and not just in 5th edition, it's happened to me in ultra-lethal games like, say, Warhammer, yeah, yeah. where I'll look at, like, say, the number of enemies that were killed. Like, man, you guys chewed through eight beastmen. I really need to make my fights harder. Moving my perspective from just behind the, the virtual screen and looking like, oh, wait, everybody's characters are below half wounds. To bring it back to 5th edition, it might be one where, gosh, like, wow, the, the player's escaped that no one dropped to zero, no one w was hurt, 
uh, you know, it was a breeze. All of my enemies are toast, and the combat only lasted like maybe four rounds. But if I look at their character sheets, that tells a very different story. They've used their all their resources. They've, yeah. you know, spell slots have been expended. Hit points have been lost. Uh, you know, potions were used. If you talk to them, they might say like, "No, man, I'm stressed. Like that was a tough <laughs> fight. We barely got out of it." If you're thinking about, if you saw the title of the video, you're just like WebDM. And you're like, yeah, well, I'll make my fights and, and combats in 5th edition more lethal. Like, I would start with having a talk with the players first. Mm -hmm. Because this video is really for people who are newish to the game, newish to homebrewing and modifying it. And also have players who have, even though they might be new, they're savvy enough about the rules and learning them that you might find the base monsters are just not cutting it. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, is that the monsters that came out in the, say, monster manual are not as robust as those that suddenly came out in Volos or Mordenkind. It's same with 4th edition and it probably prior editions of D&D &D as well. Well, I mean, it, it is the evolution of things, right. uh, is it not? Okay, so our DMs have had talks with their players. Yes, they want to make it more deadly. Let's go through some, uh, some different options on how that can be uh, made possible. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's options in the Dungeon Master's Guide to start yeah. with. Uh, these are in Chapter 9, start around page 266. They, they begin with healing variants. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one would be uh, Healer's Kit Dependency. And this is basically, you know, whenever you're, uh, you're, the characters stop for a rest, uh, short or long, and spin hit dice. This requires uh, a Healer's Kit to be used as a, as a sort of an in-game justification for the spending of the hit die. Once you start tying uh, character abilities to equipment, mm -hmm. you now open the door for uh, there to be situations where they don't have a healer's kit or it's been soiled and ruined and it's not, you know, not used or burned up because the person who had it failed their save for a fireball and their equipment got singed. So it makes the possibility of, uh, of getting to in get their hit points back. <laughs> Excuse me. It makes the possibility of getting their hit points back uh, up for grabs. Same with a lot of these. So we're looking at slow natural healing. Uh, this would be no hit points gained on a long rest automatically. That you have to use hit dice uh, to get the hit points back. Um, the gritty realism rest variant. I see this one used a lot, and, and we've recommended it for um, you know emphasizing the difficulty of travel. Yeah. And that's an eight hour short rest and a week long long rest. All of those things they uh, they slow down the game, right? Like the pacing of your game will change if you use well, I mean, all three of them, but certainly uh, any one of them. Yeah, and a lot of the ridicule uh, going towards the cleric is going to evaporate <laughs> <laughs> like mist before game. the dawn. Sure, I yeah, mean, yeah. You know, when when it comes down to like having the one person in the party who actually has a healing kit yeah. and like keeping them stocked on healing kits yeah. and keeping them alive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like you're going to start thinking about your tactics differently you're not going to have those those renegades running off in yeah. you know the, the Leroy Jenkinses of the world <laughs> let's face it they're still going to do that sure right yeah but for the most everyone else i think that it would lead to a more um, a more tactically sound game for your players. It might Hopefully. cause it might cause them to think more. Yeah. And if you have players who say rush into combats and and you're worried that you know they've expressed an interest in uh, in a more challenging fight, but you haven't seen them display any of the quick thinking and tactics that you think might be necessary to overcome the challenges, then you know letting them know like, hey, uh, hey guys, this. Things are going to be a little different than, say, the last game we played or, yeah. or however you implement the changes. You're going to need this to heal and it's going to take longer to heal. So you might want to think about things more. You might want to consider your approach to things more so that you don't, like, drop to zero and need to be, like, full healed back up. You approach things slower and maybe you don't lose as many hit points. You don't have to use as many spells. Yeah. And you can substitute tactical thinking and, and sort of approaching things uh, and it, with a mindset of problem solving instead of just like battering ram and, and we'll, our spell slots and character abilities will see us through the day. Uh, yeah, kind of kind of snap out of that video game mentality of like, oh, these abilities will come back as soon as they, re you know, yeah. the respawn. It's like, no, 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 you're going to have to take it slow. You're going to have to take it slow. And so it, it, and the pace of your campaign will slow down. If you're using, say, gritty realism rest variant and, uh, you know, they're not just like re short resting for eight hours and then not doing anything after that. They press on where they still invent adventure uh, and that these long rests happen sort of uh, in between you know forays to the dungeon or something like that. It'll slow down the pace of your game, right? There's now more time for downtime activities when they're in that week long rest period. 
Um, of course, you can still like do some things during a long rest. You don't have to be sleeping. You can be reading, talking, you know, socializing. Yeah. You can even get in a, a little bit of fisticuffs as long as it's not too much of it or too exciting, you know. Yeah, yeah. It would result in a different game, a game in which they have a lot of free time. And so you might find that's an advantageous thing or that they have no idea what to do with all this time on their hands. Those are all in the healing and rest variants. There's two in the combat section. Yeah. Uh, and that's sort of injuries, which is on page 272. And this is a, a rule that's like, all right, anytime you take a crit, anytime you drop to zero or, or fail uh, death saves by five or more, you're going to roll on this table. And a, there's going to be a lingering injury that's mm -hmm. there. You might lose an eye. It might be a hand. This would be one of those actually where I would encourage the dungeon master and player to sort of like work through it. D&D doesn't really have a hit point, or sorry, not a hit location system. It does have a hit point system. Uh, <laughs> and so a lot of combat is just arbitrary and descriptive. You hit them here, you hit them there. And if you're now attaching penalties to certain locations where you've been hit, you might want just a simple... Um, you know, hit location where it's like take a D12 and divide it between head, body, arms, legs, torso, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Got sure, it. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, do something like that so that it feels less arbitrary because it would suck to like be a, I don't know, someone that needs both their limbs. Uh, someone who uses, say, a great weapon and have one of their limbs, uh, you know, disabled for a while when it, mm -hmm. you know, at the whim of uh, the dungeon master. Yeah, just roll on the hit location, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to reinvent the monkey grip feet. So <laughs> wielding that, right. wielding that lo that great sword like guts. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, I only need one hand. I only need it. Um, but, uh, but but yeah, and like massive damage would be the other one, right? Like well, but yeah. like talking about entries, it's mm -hmm. that's one thing that I love about Warhammer. Oh yeah, like the possibility that you Why, could, you yeah. could because I'm sorry if you want this to be realistic. Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of what we're talking about, you know, there could be a possibility like, oh yeah, no, there's a reason why you're like Seven Fingers Larry. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, beyond just even like sort of realism, and I think there's some low-powered D&D uh, that, that, that works really well when you use sort of like real-world assumptions and, and realism is sort of the goal for it. Mm -hmm. But as you get up in levels of D&D, that becomes harder and harder to maintain. Yeah. But you still want like a... a um, you know, you still want a dragon to be terrifying. There is a point at which a D&D character can look at some very powerful and terrifying monsters and just go, I, who cares? It's gonna take less than a minute to deal with this. And you know, these options that are create a more lethal game will tap that down a bit. And even as you get higher in levels, it's like, oh, well, yeah, these are, uh, these are still scary, right? It's still mm -hmm. gonna take us a long time to recover from this, at least. Yeah, yeah. It'll give us pause and let us think about how we approach things. Mm -hmm. That's for injuries. Massive death is another one where it's like, if you, if you take um, more than half your hit points from a single source of damage, you make a con save and then roll on another, a separate table that has a lot of similar effects to it, but they seem more like temporary, like you're momentarily dazed or, uh, or even worse, right? Like there's some yeah, pretty can, nasty effects on that table. You, well, you can get dropped to zero and you're, right. and you're all of a sudden making death saves. Right, and if you're using both of the injuries and massive damage in conjunction, then that chances are that, that losing more than half of your hit points uh, in a single attack, it could possibly a, a crit. Yeah. So you might have an injury from that and then an injury from dropping to zero. Right. You can see how it turns the game that the base D&D &D game in 5th edition from like, oh yeah, every time I sleep, I get everything back mm -hmm. to every time I fight, I run the risk of there being permanent injuries you know, that I have to deal with. Um, obviously, Life Cleric would be a huge asset in a game like that, right? <laughs> uh, most definitely. Uh, and, and, but if you want to make that dragon seem terrifying, one crit from a dragon slash or a wing buffet, mm. and all of a sudden, your fighter got knocked across the room and is, and is currently unconscious. Right. Especially if you're using these in conjunction with low level D&D. &D. Yeah. Because, it, it, let's be honest, like first through third level is plenty lethal for most groups in fifth edition. Yeah. I find it perfectly lethal and I have accidentally killed characters at those levels even as I'm like trying to teach them a new game and like, <laughs> you know, hey new player, this is your <laughs> second time playing. Uh, we're gonna have a sample combat, oops. This Your is bard's you dead, <laughs> right? You yeah. know, uh, or at least they drop to zero. Now we yeah. get to see what the death rules uh, or the death saving throws are like. Low level D and D in conjunction with injuries and massive damage would probably be a very different game. Maybe it's the game for you, and you should try it out. Um, but those are the options that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide that are ready-made to sort of drop in your game. Mm -hmm. um, thinking through the the impact that they'll have is one thing, but 
you have more uh, tools in your DM toolbox to make the game lethal, yeah? Oh, oh most definitely. So yeah, let's let's go through uh, some some different ways that a DM could think about altering uh, their, their game or their monsters. Yeah, so there's some player-facing things that a dungeon master can do. They could cap level, right? They could just mm -hmm. say, hey guys, our campaign is not gonna get beyond X level. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Epic Six variant of third edition, it says that six level is perfectly epic. Your characters are more than, <laughs> than, than capable of portraying themselves as powerful individuals within their world. Clerics can heal diseases and cure the masses. Wizards can, you know, level an entire village. Fighters are more than a match for any average soldier or group of average soldiers at six level. From there, you still gain XP, but you don't gain any levels or benefits. Mm -hmm. The XP is used to buy feats and, and other things. Uh, that you would get. And you can use something like that for 5th uh, for edition. The, I think the fact that 5th edition has a less uh, unified progression to the classes and the way that sort of 3rd edition was like, yeah, everybody at a certain level gets a feat and gets a thing. And even though there were dead levels uh, and like it, 6th level worked for that. 5th level, you might go from anywhere from 7th to ninth level or lower. It really depends on your group. Right, mm -hmm. that you would cap a little. Uh, another way to do it is to cap HP. That's the way that older editions of Dungeon Dra Dungeons and Dragons did it. And it was, um, you know, after usually somewhere between 8th to 10th level, you stopped rolling for hit points and got a fixed number every level. Uh, and if you were a, a warrior or a fighter, you also got to add your constitution to that. But for most classes, they're only getting one or two hit points per level after a certain level. And it really did a lot to deflate those uh, hit point numbers, which meant that the game was still deadly. Yeah, and the so, players could still do more. They sure, still, yeah. I mean, they're oh, still yeah. flinging epic magic, but right. your wizard's still sitting over there with like 30 hit points. Oh, if, yeah, if God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, if that, if you're lucky. Uh, I had a, yeah, my, my, my original D&D wizard, I think was at eighth level was 30 some 32 33 hit points and that was oh, that's a lot too buff. yeah that's a lot <laughs> uh given that i spent more than four levels with single digits yeah. <laughs> for a while so it's, i got some boosts and it was, it was good so those are two things that a dungeon master can do sort of like for the players they can also mess with death saves right a common one i see is to say all right did you drop to zero then you, you, when you get back up, you still have that one fail that you got when you were oh, yeah. dropped. Oh, yeah. Um, or it might even, I've seen some people even say, like, all right, you dropped once and then you were brought back, but now you drop a second time. Well, because it's the second time, you automatically start with one of those failed. You've already been at death's door once within the last 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I, I like uh, maybe uh, doing it where the death saves only refresh on a short rest or maybe a long rest. Long rest. I like the long rest refresh. Yeah. Uh, or, or maybe something like, you know, they refresh on a lesser restoration or something like that. Oh, yeah, like oh, that. Uh, lesser yeah. restoration should be, should be able to because something like that, take yeah. care of that because still you're draining the resources. Yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's sort of how you think about it. And when you, for a, a, sort of an aside, if you kind of shift your thinking away from only looking at their hit points as a gauge for how difficult or challenging a fight was and instead like we mentioned earlier look at their entire character sheet and see which spells were used which abilities were used mm -hmm. you know very often the reason why it looks from a dm's perspective like it wasn't that challenging is because the players you know are still standing at the end but from their perspective and looking at their character sheet it's a very different story so i think that the death saves and capping hp and capping level first off they're all conversations to have with the group but the dungeon master can do things uh, on their side of the screen that, that don't really, they don't need the player's permission to do. Oh, hell no. <laughs> right, You're they the can DM. just do them, right? You can just <laughs> This is your world. And uh, those are things like adjusting the monster stats. Everything's up for grabs here. The, the numbers that are in the monster manual usually represent the average. Uh, so it's average hit points, average damage, uh, that kind of thing. That means that you can adjust all of that, particularly for hit points. You can like double them, use max to make it stand out. Now. Sometimes that can result in a slog, <laughs> you know, having a, a, a monster with a bucket of hit points, but um, not much else uh, yeah. can result in some very boring combats. So you want to be um, careful with this adjustment. A lot of DMs do this on the fly, right? Like in the middle of combat, they will adjust the stats of the monster because they're like, oh man, this is taking too long and we're running out of time. Uh, <laughs> you know, like heaven forbid that the real world intrude upon the game for a second and you have to make adjustments for it. Or maybe you're, you're simply like, man, this 
thing is about to go down and like this creature is about to I didn't expect it to die within a round and a half and I would like to do more you know I would I would, this, more than one action right you know everyone would be disappointed if it if it ended now we're having a lot of fun this is a good moment for the game if we win a couple more rounds and maybe you describe it differently too maybe uh, you know a, a, you know it gets a second wind uh, or something or a, an unseen ally bolsters it or you know, some you can smooth over a lot of these things with how you present them in the in the campaign. Uh, a monster with maximum hit points is a legendary creature, surely giant among its own kind, mm -hmm. uh, fearsome dragons, things like that. You can look to the D and D adventures as well for a lot of these things because, say, in Storm King's Thunder, the adjustments that they make to um, the dragons for the uh, Imlith and Clouf, I think those are the two names for the dragons there. They're very different monsters. They take the base one and they modify it. Same with the giants that are there and a lot of other ones. Almost mm -hmm. every one of them has, has done that. Yeah, it would be a good gauge though. That's just hit points. You can do the same with damage. Uh, if you use fixed damage, uh, then try uh, rolling random and see if that doesn't make for a more lethal fight. Or doing a mix, like I use the fixed number plus one dice of the damage to give it a bit of a variability. You can do a lot of things. You can just basically say like, yeah, every the first attack this monster makes is always a crit. Like they just, that's just their big opening mm -hmm. shot. Adjusting the armor class, whether by uh, changing the equipment that the monster has or just changing the armor class. I'd be careful there just because of the way the math of fifth edition works, but an adjustment of one to two isn't gonna hurt anything that much. And it might make for a more challenging encounter. Other than that, you can add legendary actions, legendary resistance, special abilities. Uh, th there's a lot that you could add to a monster to modify it. Mostly we're here to tell you that you should be doing that. Uh, and it's a, a fun exercise and you can turn those unique monsters into something special for your campaign world uh, and, and attach a legend to them, uh, which is, you know, it was always fun when you can mix both parts of what's fun about DMing, the mechanical side and sort of the narrative side. So, oh, yeah, yeah. you got to give them some kind of signature attack if you're, you know, a certain dragon that does this one thing. Right, right, right. Or I mean, so, so I did this with uh, Medusa in Land Between Two Rivers, and I, I sort of, the Medusa has a layer that's near a node to the elemental, a uh, plane of elemental mm -hmm. earth. And so the Medusa has mastered just petrification magic, period. Earth yeah. magic, period. And they're more like a, an earth bender from, say, Avatar than they are uh, just like, you know, the, the snake-haired Gorgon petrifies people with a glance. And so, the, you know, this particular Medusa has full mastery over the petrification, can animate the statues that she petrifies uh, at complete command of the earth. And it's just a it's just a Medusa with some things changed, some special abilities added, some spell like abilities thrown in. Mm -hmm. Presented, she's a sort of majestic, terrifying sort of figure of the wasteland, who's you know a, a powerful force to be uh, reckoned with. Yeah. Um, now, I think one of the th the things about this is by tying these modifications that you make to the story of your game or whatever's going on in it, players have a chance to disrupt it and maybe weaken the monster, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I look forward to uh, my players in Starward Bound uh, interacting with the Overseer again. Because that was a, a, a monster. I, I wanted an Illithid, but a little bit extra. And he's a body yeah. modification guy, so he's the Overseer. And he gave himself some beholder eyes at the end of his tentacles. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that was fun. Fun, yeah. Poly polymorphing uh, the barbarian is... <laughs> it's fun. It's one of my best. Being able to moments. land a polymorph on a barbarian is pretty... That's... Well, I, I was rolling, I mean, the there thing is, is I was rolling <laughs> randomly. Like, I was rolling randomly for what beam would go off. Oh, yeah, I yeah. wanted, you know, there were four, and it was like disintegrate and polymorph, and yeah. one was charm and telekinesis. Yeah. So it was like, two of them were pretty bad. Either you right. take them out of the fight, or you, you could kill them. Right. Um, you know, some, some red shirts got red shirted, mm. but mm. that's what Do they're that. there for, right? <laughs> but, but that's a good point, right? Because if you are in that, if you're in this uh, transitionary phase where, you're, where you go from playing like the base game, no modifications, we're all learning this, to a game where we're making it our own, and part of that is making it more challenging, then maybe you do have some red shirt NPCs who take the brunt of some of the attacks and, and that's you, for a while, right? Like, not always, but it, they are there to sort of show the party, like, this is what's in store for you. Here's what we've chosen. This guy got his arm ripped off, mm -hmm. you know, or this, she got disintegrated. Yeah, this guy just got disintegrated. <laughs> right? uh, that's sort of one way of approaching it. Uh, in terms of like modifying your monsters or things that you can do. Right. Last little bit is just think about the action economy. Uh, one way uh, of making things more lethal is to have uh, your monster have more actions or mm -hmm. to have more of them there. So you might even, you don't even need to modify a monster if it has a lot of minions and, and things like that. So yeah. 
Considering the action economy, I, I think for me, that's literally counting up the actions on each side and looking and seeing is one of them like way out of balance, then they're probably gonna win. And that's sort of my gauge for the difficulty of a fight a lot of times. So. Oh, oh, definitely. Yeah, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta at least get close to what they can do. Right, yeah, so. I mean, if you really want to challenge, yeah, if you, if you have a lot more actions than they do. But if you have those actions, <laughs> uh, how, does, how does a DM use them? Is that, uh, is that another way to think about this? Oh yeah, there are things that you can do that require no changes to the game at all. And it's entirely about your approach to playing the monsters and, and your approach to how you present combats and everything. So to me, the big one here, the one that I tr really try to get into is playing my monster as a, as a piece in the game. Yeah. And so like, what would my monster do? How would they approach this situation? Uh, are they just like a, a brutish beast that charges headlong and attacks whatever uh, threat it seems the most obvious, or are they cunning and, and, and manipulative? Are they disciplined and orderly? Like all of that is gonna color how I approach the game. Because to me, role-playing the monster, role-playing the NPC, and how they would approach a combat is a big part of the challenge of it. A lot of the monsters that, uh, that are in the Dungeon Master's Guide, if you sort of like think for a minute of, of you know, how would this creature exist in the world? How would it approach things? What does it know about its own abilities? Yeah. Then it, it might turn some creatures f that go from say, like, you know, it looks like they're brutish. Give me an example, like an ogre mage. Yeah. Seems like they're a big brutish type creature. They've got a big area of effect attack. They can sneak around, but they're an ogre essentially, right? And you might want to think of them as like this magical battering ram of sorts. But if you look instead at the fact that they're they can always be invisible, and they have a host of other spell-like abilities, they're, if you use them in a role of like a harasser, of someone that, that can come and go as they please, uh, in, in say a dungeon or a wilderness environment where they might find them, then that's a different sort of encounter. Yeah. Uh, and looking at the spell-like abilities of everything, this is one of the reasons why I recommend rolling your random encounters ahead of time. Uh, and even though you're rolling them randomly and you know using your tables or whatever, and you're like, ah, I throw out that result because I don't like it. Whatever method you use, getting a chance to read what's going on with the monster first before you sit down with the fight, as opposed to, oh, I rolled this encounter in the middle of the fight. All right, let me look up the stats. What can it do? Whatever. You know, if you're using like simple monsters, maybe that's okay. But if you're using more complex monsters, you deserve a chance to sit down and think about how you're going to approach things. Well, I mean, you need to know what the monster can do, yeah. So you can use them in the best way possible. Because sure. if they are a fairly intelligent monster, they're gonna come at a problem like, say, some murder hobo adventurers <laughs> busting up in their dungeon. Right. Well, guess what? <laughs> now we got to dispatch the troops, right? Now we got to dispatch the troops. Yeah. So to me, my my sort of like top five strategy and tactic strategy slash tactics, because there's a difference, obviously, are these, right? The first one would be know your enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, an approach to dungeon mastering that uh, that treats the game world as a, you know, sort of seriously. I don't just know what the players can do because I'm the dungeon master, but my enemies can find that out. Maybe they're spies, scouts, people that are, you know, mm -hmm. trying to get the uh, information that they want from the party. Uh, there's magic involved. Uh, there's the party's reputation. There's survivors from their battles, particularly if... Uh, you know, you sort of go with the fact that all the monsters also make death saves and in the middle of a fight the players rarely take the chance to just like kill a downed opponent. So if they just loot the corpses and leave, then they probably maybe left some people alive and maybe that's how, uh, you know, their reputation precedes them. Uh, it, it, this, turn, this can turn into sort of a, a game, which may be what you want, as the party attempts to keep their enemies from learning information about them while they also uh, are learning information about their enemies. To me, that's the appeal of uh, this sort of thing. You can also watch our video on combat as war versus combat as sport for uh, some more approaches to this. Uh, the second one when you're thinking about strategies and tactics for your uh, enemies uh, is reserves. And reserves are always useful and they should be kept out of line of sight of the rest of the party if possible. In the wings, in a separate room, through a teleportation circle, just beyond the veil of reality, uh, waiting to slip through once the moment is right. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of different <laughs> ways, but you don't want your reserves to be, say, accidentally fireballed. Um, <laughs> you know, but you do want them in the world somewhere. You don't want them like in a, in a fictional non-space, like, you know, the Matrix loading room before yeah. they come in. They, they're in the world somewhere, but they're hidden, you know. Yeah. This is useful for many reasons. Number one, because they're out of line of sight, if you don't need them, 
you can always just say they did something else or they were too scared or there's any number of justifications for why they might not come in. Ones that fit with the overall tone of the game. You can bring them in as a way, an extra wave, right? Whenever you need it. And if it turns out that after the first round of combat you have a, a crazy alpha strike because all the players went first before you had a chance to and they opened up with all their AOE and best attacks and it might be like, oh shit, it's in the reserves now. Yeah. Um, that's, <laughs> that's just what you can do. So having something, a, a buffer, not committing all your forces at once uh, is uh, something that you should probably be doing. Uh, readying actions would be a third. Don't forget readied actions. Uh, there's a lot of conditions which you might want to use them, like uh, I'm ready in action to anyone who's attempting to heal uh, to ranged attack them, or ready in action to uh, you know trigger a trap that the party might be near, something in the environment. Um, same goes for like dodge, other sorts of actions. Number four would be divide and conquer, and that is if you can, split the party. Uh, the wall spells are great for this, wall of force, wall of fire, wall of stone, really the ones that form a barrier because the mm -hmm. party will brave a wall of fire if, if they're desperate enough, yeah. right? Or like a pit trap that brings them down to another level. Brings them down to another level, a shifting door, uh, a mm -hmm. sliding door, a, a spinning room. There's a lot of like mechanical things you can do at the dungeon uh, that are there. You can split their priorities in that you maybe a part of your force threatens something that they care about and you force them to be like, you know, you can't be in two places at once. Maybe you yeah. split the party. You got to take one of the player's loved ones. They're, right. They're being held hostage back here. Uh -huh. So the fighter <laughs> runs in. Players will resist splitting the party, but you know, if you can, it's a good way to make the game more lethal. Um, and finally, number five is mixed arms. Uh, don't, uh, having just one monster type that does one thing is, it makes for a less dynamic combat. It gives you less options. Having multiple monsters with multiple different ways to attack, uh, obviously it makes the solo fight, the PCs versus one monster, not as, um, you know, not as frequent in your games. Mm -hmm. But I think you'll find if you include lots of different monsters with lots of different attack types that, that uh, threaten the PCs on a wide range of levels, big bruisers to engage the melee guys, and ranged attackers, and spell support, and fast strikers who can come in and, and all over the, the battlefield. That's one way that you can um, challenge the party because now they've got lots of different threats to think about. Other than that, <laughs> the individual monsters require, a, uh, you know, a, a, some of them require a lot of thought and yeah. um, we could spend like the next hour talking about particular <laughs> tactics. Of, yeah. That's kind of my top five of what I try to keep oh, yeah. in mind when I'm uh, running a challenge in combat. Any closing thoughts here after after kind of going through this? They got the DMG options, you know, you can, you can mess with the, mm -hmm. the monsters mechanics. You can mess with how they fight. Any, yeah. any closing thoughts, though? Part of the reason why you might want uh, a challenge in combat or a combat that, that uh, is deadlier is that you want to vary the levels of tension in your game. Yeah. Uh, there's an idea that, that part of the appeal of RPGs is this rise and fall, this build up and release and that combat is one of the ways in which uh, t tensions are released, but there are also ways that tensions can be built, right? Particularly if it's a tough combat where the outcome is unclear until the very end. So a mix of these kinds of things is good. A mix of lethality is good. Old school RPGs do this through randomness. They, they let the dice determine the, the variables in the mixing and then they enjoy the spontaneity of it and the fact that it's different every time. Yeah. And so if you're not doing that, right, if you're not using those random variables in the old school style, then you have to plan out and sort of say like, okay, well maybe this one's not as tough as the last one. And you have a couple of like, say, hard to medium fights and then you ramp it up with like a quad deadly, <laughs> you know, something like that. Oh yeah. Uh, but it's the mix of it. it that, that's the appeal uh, for a lot of players. Not necessarily the individual level of challenge, but the fact that there are variable levels is what's appealing. You gotta fight uh, Kano before you can get to Goro, and you gotta <laughs> fight Goro before you get to Shang Tsung. So, you know, you gotta ramp up. Right, you gotta ramp up. <laughs> when you're changing things, uh, particularly if you're making the game more complex, which a lot of these things will do, uh, yeah. then it has the potential to drag things down. And if yeah. you're finding your fights are already running long, but that people aren't being challenged, then the only advice I have there is perhaps a different game would suit you better. Uh, and that fifth edition just might not be your game. No big deal. There's plenty of games out there to try. But if you're in a position where you're like, yeah, we're, we're good. Our pacing in combat's good. People are on it with, with their spells. They, they, they know what dice to roll. Even if they're new, they're, they're, they know the game. Yeah. Um, these changes might slow things down, so you need to be prepared for that. Uh, and then, as always, this is a group discussion. Unless you're adjusting monster stats, which again, you don't need anybody's permission to do, even though some players will get bent out of shape about it. Um, it, it 
the other changes and just the approach to things overall is worth a discussion with the yeah. table. Uh, because as we always say, this is not one person's game, it's your group's game. Yep. And talking about it is almost always the answer. So Communication <laughs> is key. And they don't need to be memorizing uh, monster stats anyway. Sure. That's, that's metagaming, which we have two videos on. Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. Can I want to go right into... Do uh, I have to take these knives off? I have to take my knife hands. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Didn't say no.